HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Hopefully most of you know that Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks, uh, but you may not know that they have a whole bunch of other stuff that you can listen to, like Audible Originals and guided meditations and news and podcasts and things. You can get a free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth so that you can explore on your own and find um, the items that are of interest to you. Over the years, Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast has uh, continued to gain recognition as a great resource for business owners, leaders, sales professionals, and this is because of the guests. These are folks who join me to have a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. That way you can get the answers you need and do better things in your business, be happier, more successful, and all the good stuff that comes with uh, being a professional. Today is no different. My guest today is Robert Wright. Robert is the founder of Wright Law Office, PLLC, a boutique virtual law practice that helps e-commerce sellers across the globe protect their online businesses. Since launching his practice, Robert has advised thousands of e-commerce sellers on how to protect their personal assets, bulletproof their brands, weaponize their works, and safeguard their sales online. To better understand the needs of his clients, Robert launched his own physical products business and currently sells in the United States and throughout Europe. Thanks so much for joining me today, Robert. Oh, thanks so much, Diane, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the show. 
Well, I am happy to have you on the show. Um, I We're going to be spending some time today talking about um, a variety of things around the topic of uh, business owners protecting themselves, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I think, A, is a huge topic, B, with everything that's been going on and the potential that more and more people are going to be going into business for themselves, yeah. uh, I, I think it, you know, it becomes an even more important topic. You know, it, it's certainly timely, if nothing else. It's one of those things we yeah. all have to be mindful of as we, as we go to market and we launch businesses, but, but especially these days, uh, you know, just, just it's, it's more important than ever, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, no question. So what would you say would be the most important thing that a business owner can do when they're launching to protect themselves? Yeah, well, you know, first and foremost, you know, as you think about launching a business, I kind of run and, and gravitate towards protecting your personal assets. You know, I, I think, you know, most of my clients are, you know, startups, young companies, they're, they're very much, you know, entrepreneurs uh, at, at heart. And within the entrepreneur community, there's very much this mentality of, of, you know, just hustle and move fast and break things and then figure out all the all the, the stuff that it's, you know, the legal stuff kind of later on down the road. To me, I, I think that's, it's kind of created that what I kind of call side hustle syndrome, people that are just taking action, they're just moving. And then, you know, we'll, we'll dot the I's and cross the T's later. And that's not, it's really not a smart thing to do, right? If you're going to go into business for yourself, you want to make sure that your personal assets are going to be removed from the field of play. And the only assets that are ever going to be at stake are the assets of the business. And so, you know, kind of my first port of call for clients is they're thinking about, you know, launching a physical products business, or maybe they're going to do some sort of consulting. Maybe they're an infopreneur, they're going to create a course and, you know, do master classes or whatnot, is really forming a, forming a business entity uh, and then running all of their business operations through that, through that business vehicle. For here in this, you know, for folks here in the States, you know, the limited liability companies are a really nice way to go about doing that. You know, if you're overseas in, in Europe or in Australia, PTY Limited or a UK Limited certainly, you know, are, are good vehicles that you can leverage, regardless of where you are physically in the world. You know, the first step is really the same. It's making sure that you have a proper business vehicle to run your business through and that you're actually doing that once it's created and once it's up and running. So that's. Um, I totally agree with you, and it's interesting. I think a lot of people think they can just like hang a shingle and do the solo um, or the solo proprietor yeah. road. Yeah. Uh, okay, so talk about why that's not a good idea. What's the danger in that? Well, the danger is that you are the business, and the business is you. You know, again, it's that notion of just if I if I go out and I take action and I and I hustle and I grind and you know then then I'm I'm fine, right? I'm 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 hanging a shingle. I'm a real business. Well, you really aren't. Right. So under the eyes of the law, if it's just you and you're going out and you're doing business activities uh, to generate a profit, well, you are the business and the business is you, meaning that, you know, your house, your car, your personal bank account, if something were to go sideways in your business, all of those assets all of a sudden are at risk. You know, it, likewise, if you're working with a, with a colleague, you know, you've got a partner and the two of you all are going out there, you're going to market, you're, you know, painting houses, you're selling physical products, you're, you know, collaborating on a, on a course, you know, it, the, the line of business really doesn't matter. You know, what's important is, is the effort that's behind it. And if, if you all are going out there trying to, to generate a dollar, well, again, now your your personal assets are at risk. Even more so in a partnership, it gets really strange. Um, you know, well, how much of the partnership do you actually own? And okay, was it, you know, were we really 50-50 partners? Were we 60-40? Were we something else? All of a sudden that gets just to create a whole uh, headache and a, and, a, and a bit of mess. We want to avoid all of that, right? Like when I go and, and I go to market and I sell products or I'm selling services, I want to make sure that it's not me individually that's doing that. It's not me and a partner that are doing it. It's the business that's doing it. And again, you know, organizing a limited liability company, incorporating, if you're looking to, you know, ultimately take on some investment is certainly a smart thing to do, kind of a proactive thing to do, but just having that formal business vehicle through which you can run all of your business endeavors, really, really important and pretty straightforward to do it is also the really good thing is, is a part of that. Okay, I, I want to pull a little on the um, uh, 
like joint venturing, you know, doing something mm-hmm. with someone else. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think people, um, they get all excited about whatever it is they're going to do, and they mm-hmm. think we're all adults and we're friends or whatever, and, and everything's yeah. going to be fine until it isn't. Until it isn't. Um, right. And then, <laughs> there's all and then, it, and then it's really, really right. bad, Diane. Yeah, it goes, it goes sideways very quickly. It does. Exactly. It does. You know, yeah. I, uh, so, it, so talk it, some about that. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, it, and it's funny. I mean, it's, it's entrepreneurship, if you're going it alone, can be a really lonely business. You know, it's you sitting in front of a computer. It's you, you know, kind of trying to go out and, and grow and develop a, a business or a brand. And I, I get it why you want to do that with somebody. And especially if, you know, maybe I have certain skills, you know, I'm good at, um, you know, the numbers and I can, I can help, you know, chart, you know, uh, development and growth strategies. But you know what? I, I need somebody who compliments me uh, and, and the things that I'm not so strong as to really, you know, amplify and grow this thing. And, and there's certainly reasons to be in a partnership. But, you know, as I sit with clients, um, you know, and, and they're contemplating partnership, you know, really what I encourage them to do is, is, you know, think about the divorce with as much excitement and forethought as you are the marriage, right? I mean, because that's really what you're talking about when you're with somebody in a partnership. Um, and, and at some point, that partnership is going to end. It could be, you know, hopefully it's because the business has been a booming success and everybody's walking away a winner, but still that's something that needs to be contemplated. More likely, um, you know, it could be that, you know, things didn't go the, the way that you planned. Somebody, you know, maybe isn't pulling their weight. Maybe somebody just gets, you know, kind of checked out and they just don't want to do that anymore. Well, how do you unwind everything that happened? How do you let somebody kind of check out of the business uh, and keep it going if, if that's what you want to do? I mean, really, when you talk about partnership, it's exciting, it's fun. You know, you've got, you know, got people gathered around the table, there are big ideas being kicked around, but it's worth that moment's pause of, okay, we're all excited about what this looks like now. Let's contemplate what this looks like when uh, this is no longer, you know, up and running. When somebody wants to leave, you know, how, you know, how how are we going to go about doing that? Really, you know, that's that's where a, a lot of you know not so easy conversations happen. And and really, kind of as I work with clients to to help them through those conversations, and as they have them on the, the have those conversations themselves, you know, my guidance is really if you're not comfortable talking about these sorts of things now. Are you really comfortable, you know, getting into a partnership and doing business together? Because, you know, business is not always, it's not always the, the fun, uh, you know, parts of things. Sometimes there are difficult discussions that need to happen and, and difficult discussions that, that need to, ha- that you need to have. And, and so if you're having that sort of hesitancy up front, that's really, to me, kind of a, a little bit of a red flag of, well, maybe, maybe this partnership route might not be the best way to go about things uh, to begin with. I think that's a huge point. That 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 is a big deal. That that's like an acid test, right? It really is. It really is, uh-huh. it, it, especially when it should happen. I mean, you know, early days before any you know anybody's invested too much time, too much effort, too much energy, too much whatever. Like, if we can't sit and have some really tough conversations now, yeah, maybe maybe this isn't the the right route. And you know, the cool thing is, like, as you think about doing business, especially with you know with a partner. There's, there's a lot of ways to work together with someone that's not ultimately a partnership, right? You know, you can kind of collaborate on a project, maybe as independent contractors, you know, you, you know your, your partner has one company, you have another company, there's kind of a, a joint development agreement or a relationship agreement, but you're still, you know, the owner of your company and your partner is still the company of theirs. And so, you know, a little bit of creativity sometimes can achieve the same end. You're working with somebody but you're not, you don't necessarily have that intimacy of, of them being your business partner. And let's be clear, that's what it is. I mean, being business partners is, is an intimate relationship. You're, you know, just yeah. like marriage is, you're going to be in the thick of, thick of the successes and you're going to be in the, the throes of the failures and everything in between. And if you can't, you know, count on that person to, to you know, really be there with you um, and, and, you know, be accountable, you know, be able to, to have those difficult conversations with them, it might not be, you know, partnership might not be the best route for you. Exactly. And it, and it feels to me like um, one thing that, that 
or one way to think about it is it, it's enumerating what the expectations are. So mm-hmm. there's no surprises later. There's no surprises. And, yeah. 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 And there's no reason why all parties shouldn't want to map out what what the expectations are to make sure they're on the same page, exactly. first of all, and, yeah. right? And, and yeah. to have it memorialized. So that there's something to refer back to. That there's here. a there's a record of it. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. There's this there's this. Um, it, 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 my wife and I were getting married. You, you know, as, when you get married in the Catholic Church, you do some premarital uh, marriage prep, is what it's called. And we sat with a mentor couple, and it's funny because you know as we were kind of going through that process, um, it only really. Um, I didn't really think it would have any applicability other than, well, we've got to check the box here and kind of, you know, do the the marriage prep. But it's interesting, the mentor couple that we had, you know, we're kind of talking about relationship dynamics and this notion of if we haven't talked about it, we must agree, right? This assumption that we're all on the same page because, you know, we don't necessarily have to talk about everything, but, you know, if we haven't talked about it, then we must agree. I've actually used that concept, certainly in my own marriage, but also in, in business as well. You know, I, I want to be overly transparent about expectations because ultimately yeah. it's kind of what business is all about, right? And so, you know, business partner, what do I expect of you? What do you expect of me? Let's, let's make it clear here. Let's put them on a sheet of paper. Um, I, I don't want to make assumptions. I think assumptions create really, you know, some bad things. They can create hurt yeah. feelings. They can create resentment. And so as you're going the partnership route, it's interesting because as I launched my law practice, I thought I'd be doing mostly law. It's a little bit of, a little bit of counseling and a little bit of psychology <laughs> as well. And it's around stuff like this. And that's great. Yeah. That you guys want to be a partnership. I can make that happen. But now let's start talking about the relationship aspect of things. And, and literally conversations of let's get a single sheet of paper, you know, partner A, what do you, what do you think partner B is going to be responsible for doing? Great. Let's put them down here. Partner B, what do you think partner A is uh, supposed to be doing? Okay, cool. We've got that. Does that all align? Are we all on the same page? What are we missing? Right. Um, yeah. and, and those sorts of conversations, it's just, it's kind of funny. They don't teach you that in law school. They just teach you the uh, particulars of thinking like a lawyer, but I've had to, I've had to learn some, uh, some, some psychology and some relationship building on the fly over the course of my, my career. Absolutely. And they don't teach you that in business school either, which is why so many people get into these situations that are exactly, you know, exactly. not great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so this may sound like a strange question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. Um, talk to me about Delaware. Is, is it really the best place to form a business? And if so, why? If so, why? I, I no. The, the short answer is okay. no, but it, it's a fair okay. question because Delaware, frankly, has done an, an outstanding job of kind of marketing themselves as as the business friendly, you know, capital of the world. Um, you know, honestly, it, you know, Delaware is a state, Wyoming's a state, Nevada's a state, and the reason, you know, why clients will come and say, "Well, I, I want to go to Wyoming because of you know privacy, you know, reasons," or "I want to go to Nevada because of tax reasons," or "I want to." organize up in Delaware because of, you know, uh, you know, uh, corporate tax rates and it's business friendly. And, and there is some degree of truth in all of that, but there's also this mantra that I kind of live by of, of taxes are paid where the money is made. And so if I'm sitting here in Kentucky, I'm operating a business in Kentucky, you know, Kentucky is going to want their tax revenue. Right. And so I could go to Delaware and I could organize an LLC in Delaware but I'm also effectively operating out of Kentucky, which means I would then, if I did that, I would you know, have my Delaware LLC. I would then have to come to the Secretary of State in Kentucky and say, hey, I'm operating, I'm a Delaware LLC operating in Kentucky, so let me go ahead and register as a, as a foreign entity in here in Kentucky. And all of a sudden I've got two sets of filings and two sets of registered agents and two sets of this and two sets of that. And it's, it's just kind of more of a, a mess than it actually needs to be for most small business like owners. Now you yeah. get into, you know, being kind of a large, you know, national corporation or a multi-global sort of entity, then there might be some, some reasons and some rationales to look at a Delaware or a Wyoming or Nevada. But, you know, just to me, I'm a big fan of, of keeping it simple, stupid. And if I'm yeah. launching a business, I'm a small business owner, organize where you are, because if you're, you know, 
basically headquartered out of that state anyway, you're going to have to file some paperwork in that state, you know, even if you did want to be a Delaware LLC or whatnot. And so just, you know, keep it simple, stupid, one set of filings, one set of registered agents, uh, you know, it's, uh, you've got enough complexity in, in front of you. You don't need to muddy the waters with a bunch of paperwork flying through multiple states. That's great. Thank you. Boy, I mean, that totally clears it up. And, and I've yeah. always wondered about yeah. that. So. Yeah, no, it's it's really good. It's, you know, I mean, Delaware's done a fantastic job of kind of, you know, and, and they are. I mean, they have a very sophisticated bench. And I mean, if you got into a lawsuit and Delaware were to apply, that that's not a bad thing. You've got folks up there that know about business stuff, which is which is good. Um, yeah. You know, and there are, you know, I leave the tax, you know, guidance to, to the CPAs. Um, you know, and I'm certain that there are you know, some, some tax related reasons that if you're making enough revenue, there might be some, some reasons to look at that. But again, I just, you know, most of my client base are small business owners, uh, you know, again, startups, young companies, they just, they, they just keeping it simple, stupid goes a long way for, for, toward, towards really helping them, you know, get in a position to, to have to, you know, have the opportunity to start thinking about, well, maybe we should do these other things because now we're making so much money, um, you know, but until you get to that point, just stick where you are. Yeah, right, right. Simplify, simplify. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Ex ex excuse me. <coughs> Ooh. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is happy to be sponsored by audible.com. Um, I got to tell you what I think uh, there are a couple things about audible.com that I love. One is that it's like cross platform. So if I'm uh, listening to an audio book or um, a podcast or something, and I'm in my car, I can easily move to uh, in my office or in my house or, you know, another venue without losing my place, without having to start over again. Uh, it's pretty slick, the operation they have. And there is so much content that I'm not sure people really realize is out there. Um, these days, uh, I'll be honest, one of my favorites is the guided meditations because I don't know about you, but being able to meditate through all of this has been uh, pretty valuable. Uh, and the audiobooks are great. A lot of the guests who have uh, been on this podcast have audiobooks on audible.com. So sign up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth and explore. Check it out. Check out the audiobooks, the Audible Originals, the podcasts, the meditations, you know, everything that's out there. I think you'll find that there is a real um, healthy variety of things that you can be enjoying uh, from audible.com. Today we're speaking with Robert Wright about how entrepreneurs can protect their businesses. Um, I, I want to talk some about how necessary it is for a very small business owner or a startup to have a lawyer as opposed to going online and pulling down the form. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question, right? And so obviously I'm going to have a little bit of a vested interest in being a lawyer saying, well, you should always hire a lawyer. Um, but it, it, but it's, it's interesting to me, like one of the great things about, and let's just use LegalZoom because they're kind of the, 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 uh, the most popular kind of online, you know, do-it-yourself sort of platform. Mm -hmm. To me, I, the, the thing I love about LegalZoom is that they, they highlighted kind of uh, a fallacy in the way that law was practiced, right? So for years, you know, the law just kind of manu you know, created this, uh, you know, this... Uh, unnecessarily fancy sort of mystique around it, right? And that in order to, you know, I, you know, get legal guidance, you had to run downtown to a big fancy law firm and go up an elevator in this nice big fancy building. And, you know, there's just this whole ambiance around it. And that serves a good, you know, there are clients that, that need that, that like that, that want that. But there's also a lot of folks that, especially with the advent of the internet kind of being what it is and you know, the ability to create a SaaS company just on the fly with, you know, having, having access to AWS and a little bit of coding, uh, you know, technology and familiarity, uh, the ability to sell physical products, you know, from, you know, Kentucky all over the world just by having access to the internet. I mean, it, it's, it really kind of changed the entrepreneurial, you know, landscape and, and dynamics. And, and all of a sudden, 
you know, the, the, the people didn't want that anymore. And so LegalZoom, and, and I mean, again, there's other platforms as well, but you know, kind of do it yourself sorts of platforms, they fill a very, very important uh, need in the, in the space. They really do. And, and you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of good things about it. You know, where my, you know, I have a virtual law practice, right? So I don't have a physical brick and mortar space. I never really wanted it. I wanted my office to be where my, my computer, uh, you know, would, would take me. And uh, really, I kind of fill a space that's in between the two, right? On one hand, there's a lot of people that just want to do it themselves. And, and it's totally great and fine. They answer some questions, the forms get filed, boom, you're done. And then there's a lot of people that just don't trust that at all. They want the experience of a more traditional brick and mortar law practice. But there's also people that want a little bit of both. They want kind of that ease and convenience and access that the internet provides to a legal counsel, but they also, you know, they don't want, you know, the big fees. They don't need the big fancy office. They don't need, you know, that sort of thing in terms of, of you know, getting, you know, legal guidance. And so, you know, I think short answer to your question, you know, the do-it-yourself platforms, they, they, do, um, they do provide a really good service for, for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, there's no substitute, though, for actually talking through your situation with somebody. And so, you know, the partnership example that we kind of talked about earlier, you know, if you're dead set on being a partnership, it is easy enough to go and, you know, click some boxes and, and whatever platform you choose or find some forms and just kind of pull them off the internet. And, and file them with the Secretary of State, you know, you don't need a lawyer to be able to do that, right? Yeah. But I think any lawyer worth their salt is the one that has those, those co- sorts of conversations that we were kind of talking about uh, around, well, listen, you know, have you guys thought about X, Y, and Z? And if you haven't thought about X, Y, and Z, we might want to spend some time kind of sitting around the table and getting that sheet of paper out and, you know, you know partner A, what are you, you know, what are you thinking partner B is going to do and so on and so forth. You know, to, to me, that's where the law, the legal profession has really had to up its game. You know, it can't be about just, you know, filing some forms. It can't be, um, you know, just about, you know, putting the paperwork together with the secretary of state or the trademark officer or whatever. You've got to have, you know, to be successful in the legal space these days, there has to be more of a value add because technology has made forms and templates and, you know, portals, portals accessible to everybody. Uh, and the, the, the legal professions kind of had to, to grow and, and, and navigate around that, which, frankly, I think is a good thing. You know, I think a, a little bit of, you know, not a non-traditional, a little bit of discomfort of, well, what do we do if everybody's going to, you know, just go and, and, you know, fill out, law, you know, forms online. You know, it, there's, there's good that comes out of that. And it's been neat to see how the legal professions really changed as a result of it. So, you know, tip of the hat to, to all those platforms out there, all the form sites and templates and it's all great stuff, um, but there's no substitute for actually sitting with somebody and uh, you know having the conversations that aren't in those forms, but they certainly are impacted by the forms. Wow, that that's really um, valuable, and and it made me think about. So, if if there's a business owner listening and they don't have an attorney, um, mm-hmm. I, I guess my question is. Are, are there things that a business owner should be considering? Like, how do you know whether LegalZoom is good enough? Yeah. You, you know, because that's sort of, I mean, I would think there are certain circumstances where you would absolutely want to make sure you are having the conversation with an attorney and, or at least having them review the documents before you implemented them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, I think to, to me, you know, as you grow and scale, right? Like, and, and even if it's pretty early days and it's, you know, I mean, you're not where you want to be, but you're beyond just kind of the, the, the initial launch phase, right? You know, I think you owe it to yourself to, to you know, call up a legal professional um, you know, the great thing about state bars and, and local bar associations in particular, they generally have kind of a lawyer referral hotline where you can, you know, reach out to the bar association and say, hey, uh, I'm a small business owner and I just kind of want a health check. I just kind of want to talk to somebody that, you know, knows about business stuff and just make sure that all my I's are dotted, my T's are crossed. And generally speaking, you know, those bar associations are going to be able to connect you with somebody in, in your local jurisdiction that can do that for you. Uh, certainly, you know, there's a number of, of, you know, law firms, you can, you know, any sort of Google search, you know, small business lawyer or small business law firm or virtual law practice, whatever it is, right? And you can connect with the lawyer. Uh, and generally, 
you know, there's, there's, you know, a no cost consultation, or it's going to be a low dollar sort of consultation. Uh, you know, to me that the peace of mind that's gained from just having somebody look over the documents that, that you've already done, that you're kind of leveraging and, and using, maybe it's your business formation documents, maybe it's, you know, kind of the standard contract template that you found online that you, you know, piece together from a couple of contracts that maybe you'd seen in the past, just to get a second set of eyes on it. You know, if you are, actively out there doing business, you're generating revenue, take, just take a moment's pause and, and just have somebody kind of do, again, just do a quick health check of, you know, my, am I, do I have all my ducks in a row? Uh, and if not, the great thing about most of that stuff is it can be addressed. You know, if you've organized your limited liability company, and let's say you didn't get an operating agreement in place when you should have, you know, kind of the rules of the road for your, for your business entity, well, you know, you can, you can get one now, or if the one that was provided to you is the form that you pulled down off of whatever site, and really it's just not tailored towards the type of business that you're doing or the type of business that you're doing now, you know, that can be, that can be addressed, you know, but what can't be addressed or what can't happen is if you're not talking with a legal professional just to give you that sort of guidance, well then, you know, who knows what sorts of landmines you might have in your business. And that's, that's not what you want. You know, your business, doing business is difficult enough. Uh, it, it, you should be able to sleep well at night when you, when you're not working. And so that little bit of peace of mind, you know, is, is a small price to pay, uh, you know, just for, for sitting down with a legal professional over the course of an afternoon, maybe looking at your documents and you know, just doing a quick health check on your business. Yeah. Cause you don't know what you, what you don't, you don't know. know what you don't right. know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah scary. Um, okay. If someone, so now let's talk about someone who is thinking about at some point, like selling their business. Mm -hmm. How do they position themselves for a successful exit? You yeah. know, are there things in particular they need to be thinking about or paying attention Ab to? Absolutely. A hundred percent. And I see this, you know, a good book of my business are, you know, people who sell physical products on Amazon and other online platforms. And that's really kind of the end game, you know, for most of those folks, you know, it, it's, we, I've found with small business owners, they're those that, you know, want to spin up a business very quickly, uh, pre deed up, get, you know, great profit loss sheet, you know, get, get, you know, the financials in, in right order and exit and go off and do the next entrepreneurial thing. And then I have clients that they want to create some, something that's more self-sustaining. They want to create a legacy for their kids. They want to take their business, grow it and expand it. And 20, 30 years later, either retire or hand it over. You know, as I work with clients, regardless of kind of what their immediate interest is, whether it's exit or, you know, well, 20 years from now, I might think about exiting. I think it's important to always, you know, be proactive around exit and kind of, yeah, contemplate the present but also look into that, that crystal ball and think, okay, when I'm sitting down to sell this thing that I've built, you know, how, how would, how would you know, people try to poke holes at it, right? And to me, you know, what I see most often, I mean, it's easy enough, okay, you make enough money and okay, I've, I've formed the LLC or incorporated and I've checked that box, right? But it's amazing to me the number of folks that, you know, they're branding, right? They just, they, they, they woke up in the middle of the night and they thought, well, this product or this service, I'm going to name it X, Y, Z, because no one ever has thought of the name X, Y, Z. And it's so innovative and it's so different and it's so new. More often than not, that's not true. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. And as you're choosing branding for your products, you're choosing branding for your services, you're choosing a logo, you have to make sure that that, that whatever branding you've chosen functions as a trademark and that it's available, right? Going out to the market and a larger market as a whole and seeing all the people who are possibly, you know, using a name that's similar to the one that you want to use. Uh, you know, not doing that diligence really, really hurts, you know, valuations later on down the road. And then certainly, you know, once you've kind of cleared the mark, your name, your logo, your slogan, uh, you know, not securing the rights to that vis-a-vis -a, -vis a formal trademark registration is another way that, you know, people that are, you know, potential purchasers of a business kind of throw rocks, uh, you know, at the owner to say, well, you know, it's great that you have, you know, all your financials in order and you've got, you know, your growth has been terrific, but, you know, you didn't, 
you know, pay attention to the trademarks, you didn't pay attention to the copyrights, you know, these product photos that you have, or maybe, you know, the uh, basis of your course, you know, did you register the copyright in those? You know, really, and I think that's where the value of, of sitting, you know, with, a, with a, a business centric kind of legal professional is really good, especially early days of, you know, okay, what, what kind of, how do you, how do you lock down the rights that you have in all of these assets that you're generating in your business, right? If you're, you know, selling physical products, you're designing physical products, you know, are they, you know, the trademark? Have you, have you secured that? The copyright of the photos of the product that you're putting on the website that you've created, have you registered that? Do you own that? Do you have the right agreements in place with your photographers to make sure that the copyrights actually even being transferred to you? Um, you know, the course that you've put together, you know, that people are just out there stealing left and right and, you know, putting all over the internet. Are you actively going around and doing any sort of enforcement measures around that? You know, are you policing your rights? You know, the one thing that I really have to kind of hammer home with clients is not only, you know, the assets that you have in your business, they're not only the physical products that you're selling or the course that you've created or the, the ebook that you've, that you've put out there, the audio book or the whatever, you know, that you're coaching, you know, kind of master plan and, and blueprint for how you do online coaching. You know, those are all certainly assets, but also the intellectual property behind that are assets as well. And, and if you're not securing that through trademark registrations and copyright registrations, maybe you know, even the thing that you don't think it would ever be patentable, well, maybe it's worth at least evaluating whether it is. You know, if you have a great profit loss sheet, you've got, you know, great, you know, great SKUs, you've got great offerings that, you know, that, that are out there that clearly have resonated with the market, and you've got all of your intellectual property rights and those assets locked down, it's going to be really difficult for someone who wants to buy your business to drive down the valuation of your business by throwing those rocks. There's just going to be fewer to throw if you've taken those proactive steps, you know, in the course of your business journey. Wow, that's fascinating. And I would imagine even if you don't want to sell your business or you're not even really thinking about that, protecting those assets is still uh, an important um, exercise. No, it really, it really is. You know, I mean, I think about intellectual property is both kind of a sword and a shield, right? I mean, certainly if you've come up with branding, that's, that's particularly unique. It's important to you. It, it speaks to who you are and what your, your products or services are. That's, that's worthy of protection, but you can't really do a lot to protect it unless you secured your rights in it. Same thing with, with copyrights. It, it drives me nuts seeing, you know, people that will, you know, invest hundreds, you know, if not thousands of dollars in, in product photos uh, or, you know, photos on their website. And then just to see them, you know, copied and pasted on eBay or Alibaba or other, you know, Etsy or other platforms, yeah. just because we kind of have this, this, uh, this belief that the internet's just kind of copy and paste. And if it, you know, there's a photo up there, it's no big deal. Just kind of taking it and, you know, using it for whatever you should want. That's, that's not how it works. But again, you can't, you can't enforce your rights unless you've taken the, the right steps to, to protect the photos that you have. Um, and so it's just, if anything, you know, trying to be proactive with clients, you know, business is complicated enough, right? I mean, getting it, you know, breathing life into business, you know, growing it, scaling it is really, really important. But don't wait until the end when you're, you've, you've done that, when you've achieved that, to then go back and register the trademarks and collect all the copyrights and think about the patents. If you can do that piecemeal along the way, it's just going to really put you in a nice spot when you're ready to pivot and go off and do that next thing. Um, you're not going to be running around, you know, the, the sale of a business just on its own is, is kind of chaotic and hectic enough. You know, if you can eliminate the noise of, of trying to, to register everything at that point in time, you're just going to have a little bit more peace and calm when you're, when you're looking to exit for sure. Right. And is it complicated to, to do that? Like if someone's like a prolific writer and mm -hmm. they're putting their stuff out, it feels to me like that, that could get like really expensive copywriting every single thing that they're creating. Not terribly. Like it, it, you'd okay. be surprised. I think, you know, when I think about registrations, I think about a couple things. I mean, one, there, there are, you know, there are fees, right? There are legal fees, there are filing fees. You know, like at the, with the trademark office, the filing fee for a single trademark is $275 in a, in a class of goods and services. 
you know, with the copyright office, it's right at about $50 per registration. Um, so much less expensive. Copyright's much more accessible, which is great. Um, also, you know, is the, the cool thing about copyright is you don't have to register one to have a copyright. So copyright vest with the author, you know, upon creation. So as soon as you create a work, you put, you know, pencil to paper, fingers to keyboards, brush to canvas, you as the author of that work have copyright. I mean, you have a protectable interest. Now, you can't really go out and enforce it until you've registered. You certainly couldn't sue anyone unless you had, had done a filing. But, you know, I, I think people, you know, especially entrepreneurs, they get overwhelmed with well, all this filing stuff and it's going to be expensive yeah. and I don't know how to do it. And it's actually much more accessible than you would think it is. Um, I, I, you know, one of the, the question, the kind of conversations I'll have with clients too is just because you can register something doesn't mean you should. You know, so I think about branding, for example, um, you know, if you're, you know, there's 45 categories of, of goods and services, right? You don't have to register in every single one. I mean, if you're, you're, the book of your business is effectively you know, make kitchen goods, but you also happen to maybe sell a hammer or some sort of tool, well, you know, maybe that, that you know, that, that additional registration for that tool uh, maybe that's not necessary. You don't really need that. What's it going to get you? What's going to be the return on investment? And so as you look at, you know, securing your intellectual property rights, that should be one of the conversations that you're having with whoever you're working with is, okay, well, you know, if we register this, what does it give us, right? What's the return that we're going to get on our, our investment? How is it going to help move our business along? Because what you don't want is just a stack of filings just for the, the sake of having a stack of filings. Every registration that you do, every means of protecting your intellectual property, there should be that ROI on the back end. And you should understand why you're doing it. And if you can't answer that question of, well, why are we doing this filing? Why are we registering this copyright? Then you might want to pause on doing it in the first place. Wow, that is really interesting and unbelievably valuable. I, I really appreciate this conversation. and. You know, one of the things that I love about it is that, that I learned something. I learned a couple of things. Um, so I, I'm pretty sure that the listeners have too. Uh, but, but boy, that, that is um, really everything that you've shared, uh, the listeners can take something away from. So, boy, Robert, I, I really appreciate that. Will you let them know how they can find you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and Diane, again, you know, the, my hope is that, you know, is, is, you know, they're on their business journey. Uh, that's, that's really what it is, right? And wherever you are, whether it's early stage or you're kind of further down the line, you know, the legal stuff shouldn't be something that you just kind of push to the side for too long. You know, it doesn't mean that you have yeah. to, you know, have, you know, a lawyer involved in everything and you certainly don't want to, you know, you know, be overly legal, but, you know, an ounce of, of, of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so, you know, getting somebody involved, uh, just to take a look at your business, super, super important as you have the time. Uh, if you'd like to reach out to me, uh, certainly feel free. Counselinthecloud.com is where you can find me online. Uh, that's C-O-U-N-S-E-L in the cloud because I am counsel and I'm, I'm virtual. So I'm in the cloud um, <laughs> and happy to, uh, happy to talk with anybody who, who just, you know, wants a second set of eyes on the business, um, you know, whether it's about, you know, business formation or trademarks, copyrights and the like, certainly happy to, to chat you up about it. That's really great, and I highly suggest people do that because uh, they'll, they'll at least get the answers to the questions that they have. And, and one of the things that I picked up on was it doesn't matter where you are in your business journey. It's not too late to do exactly. any of these things. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So. you can always course correct. You know, the only thing it, you can't course correct is if you don't know that you've taken the wrong direction. So, again, yeah, just chatting right. with somebody and, <laughs> and just saying, hey, is this – is this set of documents okay? Or this template that I'm using, you know, is that, is it really kind of the best one? Or I've been thinking about this logo and I've been using it, but you know, I didn't really check to make sure I you know, it was actually free and clear for me to use. You know, again, you know, generally speaking, putting your head in the sand, not the best business strategy. And so I'm <laughs> pulling it out, just kind of looking around, getting, getting some, uh, you know, expert guidance, whether it's a lawyer, an accountant, a business advisor, whatever it is like there's, there's, you know, there's always a place for that for sure. Yeah, definitely. That, that is really great. Well, again, thank you so much for um, spending time with me and sharing that information. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, listeners, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, this, you're who we're doing this for. And um, I'd like to thank Audible.com. Get a free trial of audible.com at audibletrial.com slash business growth and go exploring, go look around, check out all of the audio content that they have and uh, see what resonates with you. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Somewhere out there, there's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new papadilla in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. Okay, parachutes ready. Boy, the things I go through to get on all on rates as low as 0.99% APR for 60 months on new vehicles with PenFed. You are aware that you don't have to be a military member to save hundreds on your auto loan, aren't you? Anyone can join PenFed. As someone terrified of heights, I probably should have looked into that. Probably. Drop me off at the shore. PenFed Credit Union. Visit PenFed.org slash autos or call one 800 Two four seven five six two six. Advertised rates available through the PenFed car buying service. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. We are Jackie Clayton and Katie Van Horn, co-hosts of the Inclusive AF podcast. We're two diversity, equity, and inclusion peeps who love both what we have in common and what makes us different. During the day, we use our superpowers to block bias and break down systems that are inequitable within companies and create inclusive AF places to work. We're also BFFs who have tough conversations about our different lived experience. Come have a listen and learn something new.